Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you all very much uh, for being here today. It's great to see so many people live in person. I think this is the first time I've seen this large of a group um, in about two and a half years. You see this large of a group more regularly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but welcome to everybody who's here in person and welcome to everybody who's uh, watching online. Uh, great to have you all with us here today. Um, and um, thanks to the State of the Net team for giving me this opportunity to be here this morning with all of you and this, for this fireside chat with Representative Michael McCall. Um, Congressman McCall, who's the chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, is very familiar to all of you in tech policy circles. Um, since he came to Congress, he's been working on these issues um, very, very actively from, from Internet policy to cybersecurity policy. He is a force to be reckoned with on a regular basis representing the 10th Congressional District, uh, which stretches from Austin to the Houston suburbs. Um, at the start of the 116th Congress, Congressman McCall became the Republican leader of the House Foreign Affairs Committee after leading the House Homeland Security Committee. That's where we got to know each other. Um, we do a lot of Homeland Security work at my firm, and, and him being such a leading voice on cyber is, is uh, kind of a natural affinity for us. Um, in, his, in his capacity as the committee's Republican leader, uh, Representative McCall demonstrates an unwavering commitment to international engagement with our allies, countering the aggressive policies of our adversaries, and advancing stability and democracy around the world. I'm doing a great job. Doing a great job of it today. <laughs> it's a super exciting time, um, so very timely to have him here with us today on all those issues. Um, additionally, all of us in the tech community know him for his leadership as co-founder and co-chair of the Congressional High Tech Caucus and the Cybersecurity Caucus both of which provide him the ability to enhance Texas's role as a global leader on technology. So um, let's get right into it. Um, I have some questions for you, and, and, um, and we'll go from there. So Congressman McCall, you've been around technology issues, particularly cybersecurity, throughout your tenure in Congress, and you're clearly a thought leader in this space. One of the issues you've consistently talked about is the need to adopt international cybersecurity norms that would govern behavior by nations around the world. Can you talk a little bit about why you think this is such an important issue and how you're working with your colleagues in Congress and folks in the Biden administration to advance global cyber norms? Yeah, and thanks, uh, Andrew. Th and thanks, everybody, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, if I could just maybe step back in why I think this is uh, the last piece of the puzzle. About 15 or so years ago, we looked at the federal government. We thought, OK, who's going to have what role? I mean, who's going to defend the nation? Who's going to be offensive? Who's going to share information with the private sector? And there were, were, there were debates. Uh, you had the, the DIB, uh, did, you know, the industrial base um, uh, pilot program at NSA. And there was some thinking that maybe NSA was a great, the perfect place to warehouse uh, the intersection with the private sector to share threat information and, you know, to the civilian side <clears throat> and the private sector. And then a guy named uh, Snowden came around, kind of messed that idea up a little bit. We really thought the Department of Homeland Security seemed to be the best place because it, it was a civilian agency to interface with the private sector, share threat information, and protect um, the systems. Um, the problem was at that time, it was not uh, the capability was the issue. And I know we'll get into CISA later, but, you know, to, to stand up CISA authorized into law and um, see where it's, it's come since back in the day when it wasn't as capable, I think he would agree. But I think now it's, it's at a much better place. So offensive, obviously, Department of Defense, NSA, Stand up, stands up domestically in a time of war, uh, gr have great offensive capability. Defense has always been, you know, the, the challenge, uh, the struggle. But the missing piece that we have yet to really tackle, and I have my Cyber Diplomacy Act uh, within the State Department, and state is actually standing this up as my bill languishes in the Senate, which unfortunately that happens a lot in Congress. Everything languishes in the Senate. And they don't really do a whole lot. So it's sitting over there. But this is where we really have, and, and I think what's happening right now demonstrates a need for this, <clears throat> international norms and standards. You know, I co-chaired the CSIS uh, report back in the day, and it, it was uh, at that time most downloaded report. But um, 
We, there's no definition of cyber warfare, you know, uh, no norm standards. We could be, you know, working with our allies on this, you know, this piece. And I just throw out as a question to the audience, um, as we look at the current conflict, and we know Russia has great cyber capabilities offensively, uh, and they've been attacking uh, particularly the Baltics, uh, in Estonia gets, you know, and I've been there many times. Um, you know, as we look at what's happening right now with NATO and Article 5, you know, if tanks rolled into Poland or into Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, we would certainly throw the red flag down and say that that's a violation of Article 5 and therefore triggers a NATO full uh, retaliation attack against one and attack against all. Um, and then we would be in a World War III, which we're trying to avoid. Uh, you know, that's if, you know, he talks about his nuclear weapons, right? Clearly. But if you get, get into the cyber <clears throat> element, what if today he had a very destructive attack, not just in Ukraine, but in a NATO country? Uh, what is the proportionate response does that trigger Article 5? It raises all sorts of issues that we, to this day, are still ill-prepared for. Um, and so I guess to your, to your long-winded answer, but that's why this last piece, which we still haven't finished yet, and it's kind of exciting, we did the other step, but this is really the last piece of the puzzle that we're trying to put together as it impacts international norms and standards. You know, Private sector cannot hack back. That's illegal. Although I talked to a lot of companies that would love to do that. <clears throat> that is the role of the Fed. We don't want a wild west. Everybody's shooting their guns off. So we need uh, rules of the road. But we need um, to know what is a proportionate response back. At, once you do the attribution <clears throat> and you know, <clears throat> you know where it's coming from, then um, I would say we've crossed, uh, too, had too many red lines Remember ransomware attack on Colonial, you know, and then we put some red lines up and they get crossed again, you know, and it's just like the father of five. If you don't have consequences of bad behavior, guess what? Bad behavior continues. It's a very simple concept. We don't have that. And they hit with impunity, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. And I would argue that our response to this day has not been adequate. And the consequences have not had certainty to stop the bad behavior. So therefore, the bad behavior continues. And that's precisely, Andrew, where we find ourselves uh, uh, today. You know, it's, as, as, um, as you look kind of at, uh, across your time here in Congress and, you know, the time where you came here and the time we are now, yeah, your tenure here coincides with tremendous advancements in technology, right? Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of that is kind of what you're reflecting on now is like we've, we've had new and different things, you know, uh, kinetic versus cyber or combinations of kinetic and cyber. Um, and we also have kind of evolutions in technology. When you first came here, you know, we lived largely in an on-premises software world. Now we live in a cloud-first world, um, and companies are transitioning to cloud applications. How do you see that? You know, how do you see that policy um, evolving as well to one where, where you know, are cybersecurity policies keeping up with the transition to the cloud? Are our cybersecurity policies still based more in a kind of on-premise software world? How do you think about this uh, and look across your your time here in Congress? Well, I mean, it's just like uh, any, you know, when the Internet came out uh, and nobody really, a lot of people didn't understand it. <clears throat> and it's, you know, technology is neutral, but it can be used by good or for good or bad purposes. And the cloud has a very good security feature to it. Um, we are worried uh, there's a, a – in the EU has a, a law that's very parochial that would stop uh, our – basically, it's punitive to our companies, while at the same time very friendly to China and Russia. So we sent a letter to the president, uh, bipartisan, uh, <clears throat> that we need to address uh, this legislation that the EU is looking at. I think given the current events, they're going to walk back that legislation. <laughs> at, least, at least I would hope so. Um, but that's, uh, you know, the cloud is, um, I mean, it, it's here, it's now. 
Um, just like cryptocurrency, I know we were going to talk a little bit about that. I was on a panel with the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin at the Milken Institute. I know just about not to be dangerous on cryptocurrency. Milken is like you know the wizard expert, but one thing is clear, I and mean, it's the same thing. Like crypto can be used for good or bad purposes. Blockchain is really the stability. Um, but um, imagine right now if Russia had its own digital currency. Would these sanctions have any impact? No. Uh, China in the future. China is working on its own, as you know, the one, its own digital one. Um, and um, <clears throat> Iran, another good example. But I think the Russian example is most pertinent. If they had their own digital currency, talking about SWIFT, it, it really outdates, makes SWIFT outdated. Uh, but yet it's, it's going to happen just like the Internet happen. And we got to be prepared for this. And what, what are the ramifications of digital currency? And what would be the ramifications of countries having their own digital currency? Because I think that is going to be the wave of the future. And I argue, and Mnuchin as well, that the United States has to lead and we need to set the rules again, you know, rules of the road on this. And we need to start working on our own digital currency. I mean, I think you can, you know, everyone's saying how much the pandemic sped along the transition to, you know, to, to cloud technologies and the new technologies so that, so that people could work remotely. And, and as you, as you look at what's happening right now in terms of, you know, Russia and Ukraine and, and, you know, European uh, reaction and United States reaction, you could, you could see a world in which countries who see themselves as, as, as adversaries to Western countries look at things like SWIFT and cutting off other financial tools and say, okay, what do we need to start doing now to modernize, modernize our systems, our technologies, in order to, to take that off the table, right, for Western countries? And, and you know, that is, that, is, that is a significant challenge, right, because it does take a, it does take a, a long-held traditional tool for, for the United States and Western governments off the table uh, and it's going to require, you know, require people to think more, more, more interestingly, right? Mm -hmm. What are the next set of tools that you use if bad actors do things, but they've moved to a uh, right? To a and what, what sanctions would be effective with digital currency? Because it's it's basically a, a movement away from like central banks and financial institutions to more digital. And um, of course, all the sanctions right now are on the banks, oligarchs. Putin himself, and we have export, some export uh, controls, yeah. which I, I think we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about this move to the cloud. And, you know, as, as you know, more and more companies and countries have moved to the cloud, you know, you've seen lots of countries, China, Russia, the European Union, push data localization, right? Yep. Keep data here, um, you know, requirements that data be housed locally, you know, but companies that companies that, that provide cloud services rely on the free movement of data around the world, um, which, is, which is obviously very contrary to, to that. Um, how, do you, how do you think about kind of what we should do from a policy perspective um, to fight back against this move to, to data localization? And how does this impact cybersecurity, knowing that obviously the free flow of information in a, in a, in a cybersecurity world requires um, data to move to, and, and that, that's the only way you know kind of what's happening from a signals perspective, right? And, yeah. um, and you, can, you can detect things. So how do, you, how do you see the data localization impacting kind of cybersecurity? Well, I think the cloud can provide actually more security if it's done right. And, and you know, it was designed to share, you know, the free flow of information, as you said, but yet we're seeing, you know, countries, like I mentioned this bill in the EU, um, that we are, you know, sent this letter to the president urging him to take action. Um, <clears throat> that would uh, localize the cloud to only the EU. And it, you couldn't have this free flow of information, which really kind of defeats the purpose in large part for why the cloud was invented in the first place. So uh, that, that's the danger, right? So we don't want countries starting, you know, having their own cloud that has no interconnectivity to the international world. So I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit to um – to an issue that is um, on top of mind for a lot of folks, or has been top of mind for a lot of folks until until I guess the last few days, semiconductors. 
you've been you've been an outspoken voice on the need to do more from a U.S. government uh, perspective to to enhance uh, our ability to to manufacture, uh, design, um, and produce semiconductor chips here. Um, obviously, your congressional district is is one that houses lots of technology companies. Um, as you look at kind of the semiconductor environment um, and what's happening congressionally, um, how do you see this issue resolving itself? How do you how do you see the kind of the House and the Senate coming together to you know resolve differences in in their bills around funding for semiconductors? Um, and how are how are constituents of yours, companies in your district, talking to you about? the need for the United States to lead in, in the semiconductor space? You know, it, before COVID, if you said supply chain, <laughs> nobody would know what you're talking about, nor would they care until they held up their medical. You know, they corner 85% of rare earth minerals that they get through Belt and Road. And when I say they, I'm talking about China, <clears throat> out of um, Africa, Latin America, um, but then the, the semiconductor piece, to me, is the most critical right now. Uh, 90% of the advanced semiconductor chips are manufactured in Taiwan. So um, I was a pride talk to then Secretary Pompeo and Wilbur Ross and then, uh, and then National Security Advisor O'Brien about how can we protect, how can we manufacture more of this here or with our allied countries. We have to get it away from communist China where it's vulnerable because we know that the Chinese are trying to infiltrate in Taiwan and infiltrate TSMC. So that is what led to the sort of, um, you know, the um, expansion, if you will, of TSMC in Arizona was based on that premise. But we had to provide incentives for them to do this. So... We took that idea and I introduced uh, the Chips for America Act. Uh, Senator Cornyn introduced the companion. Doris Matsui, my Democrat um, colleague, I found after nine terms, if you're not willing to work across the aisle, you're not going to get anything done. (laughs) Legislation, that's just the way it works. And then, um, you know, we've garnered a lot of bipartisan support, everybody from Schumer to you know, McCarthy to Pelosi, and everyone likes the idea of, well, hey, if we incentivize manufacturers uh, to relocate into the United States, that not only creates jobs and opportunities and investment in the United States, but it's also a national security uh, piece. You know, chips are in everything, as you all know from your phone, (laughs) to our most advanced weapon systems. And if they're compromised, and we know that our foreign adversaries would like to, or stolen, then we, we have a real problem. Um, since the, we got this uh, bill authorized on the National Defense Authorization Bill, and since that time, you've seen enormous investment in the United States. Now, we're not finished yet, but Samsung in my district expanded $17 billion. Intel, $20 billion. Micron's looking at 100 to $150 billion investment here in the United States. And there, are, there aren't very many of these companies, but where they are, they're, they're looking at, but, you know, they're CEOs, they have shareholders, they need certainty that this idea is going to actually work. So um, I could maybe talk too long on this, but, <laughs> I, you know, I got a call from the Secretary of Commerce saying, hey, really like your chits bill. Can we just pass that thing on its own, a clean bill? I said, that would be great. <laughs> It'd be a great for the country in America, not just Republicans. Great for the administration to get a victory. Um, then, like Congress does best, we <laughs> screwed it up. So they put all this other poison pill stuff in, like $8 billion to a U.N. climate fund that could go to China where they manufacture batteries and solar panels in the Xinjiang province where they commit genocide. So it didn't seem like that was very good policy to me to muck up this chips bill with all this other stuff. So uh, here's where we are now. We're we're doing what's called a conference committee. We haven't done one of these in a while. (laughs) (laughs) You must have worked on the Hill. (laughs) So so the, the, the Senate actually... 
I don't normally applaud the Senate. They did a pretty good job. They passed my chips bill and then what's called the Endless Frontiers, which is a heavy investment in research and development and everything from National Science Foundation to DARPA. You know, if we're going to compete with China that's putting a trillion dollars in its digital economy, that's everything from AI to 5G to quantum, uh, you name it. They just shut a hypersonic off that we didn't think they had, but they do. Circled the, you know, the world and landed with precision with a nuclear payload. And, and we don't have that, and we can't stop it because of maneuvers. So we're behind. <clears throat> we, got to, we have to compete is the point. And that's the point of this bill. Um, my bill on the uh, semiconductor manufacturing side, and then a heavy investment in research and development um, to catch up, not catch up, but just compete uh, primarily with uh, globally with the great competition of our generation that is against communist China. The long term, they're the greatest national security threat to the United States. So that's why this bill is so important. So I'll be on a conference committee, and we're going to try to strip all this stuff, poison pills, out of the, you know, from the House side, merge it with the Senate, and then it goes House, Senate, to the president. The White House likes, I mean, we were, I was in the, the Oval Office with the President Biden, and there were eight of us, half of us tech, half auto manufacturer members, and he said, this is great. I wish every meeting I have was like this, because everyone supports it. And that's why I'm optimistic it will get over the finish line because there is so much support for it um, from Schumer to the president to from, you know, Pelosi to McCarthy. And uh, when we do, uh, you're already seeing the investment, but you're going to see an explosion of investment. We also have a, a, a multinational piece to it for our allies as well. I don't care as long as we're manufacturing this in places where it's not vulnerable to um, the IP theft being stolen, which they know to, how to do very well. I think the, I think the uh, multinational piece of that has you know, garnered great attention, uh, particularly in Europe, right? It's something that, something that um, the United States wants to do in collaboration with allied countries and, and um, makes, makes good sense and, and is something that and we like should say, push since, forward. Since the introduction of the, our bill, we're seeing European countries yep. introducing the same, same, thing. same thing. So we're... In a way, it's a global competition all the way around. But, you know, if it's with our allies, you know, I, I, that, that's where it needs to be. Um, let's, let's stay on this China theme for a minute because you've been spending a lot of time for the last year, year and a half as part of the China task force that, um, that, um, that you've got with a bunch of your colleagues in the House looking at these issues of kind of U.S. technological superiority, U.S. technological kind of challenges vis-a-vis -vis China, U.S. industrial policy vis-a-vis um, -vis China. How do you see kind of the, this, this kind of great power competition shaping up uh, with the U.S. and China, and what should Congress's role be in order to advance um, policies that help, uh, help the United States stay on or maintain or get a better footing when it comes to competing with, with China and other countries like that? Yeah, and, yeah, great question. So I chaired this China task force. We came out with uh, um, over, like 400 recommendations, uh, mostly bipartisan, uh, many of which have, have passed. Uh, but the Chips for America Act was, was the number one recommendation. <clears throat> but we also, um, I mean, there's a panoply of issues, but the, the, the overarching goal is to be more competitive because we're not. No, we're not in Africa. We're losing in South America, Indo-Pacific. You know, we, we have to, we need economic alliances like with trade uh, and we need to, but when it comes to competing with China, uh, they invest huge amounts of capital in research and development. And this is why I think, you know, this bill that I was talking about, it's imperative that we pass it to be, you know, more competitive, or they're going to start going ahead, just like with the hypersonic weapon, that now we're trying to catch up, you know, to them. Uh, Huawei, you know, they're installing that all over. The, the Belt and Road Initiative is a brilliant. I mean, they are very, very clever. I mean, under the UN, there are a developing nation. So what does that mean? They qualify for almost interest-free loans from the World Bank. 
that they can then turn around and loan to truly developing nations at a usurious interest rate, get them into a debt trap, take the rare earth minerals, put their own workers in, and then, hey, um, we want that port or that military base. This is happening throughout the Indo-Pacific, Africa, Latin America. <clears throat> and, and we're finally waking up. And I think COVID, you know, we woke up to some extent. Um, not to digress, I'll make this really fast. In 1997, I was a federal prosecutor here, and I prosecuted this guy, Johnny Chung. And he led us to the director of Chinese intelligence, China Aerospace, putting money in his Hong Kong bank account to put in the presidential election. And why? Uh, two things. They wanted the dual-use technology and the satellites, and, and they, they wanted to get in the WTO, and they got both of those. And since that time, uh, they have progressed tremendously you know, in that space. They're in space, by the way. That's why we created the Space Force. Um, <clears throat> so they are, um, their technology capabilities, and this will get to the heart of your question, we gave them a lot back in the day, and we tried to bring them in the family of nations. I talked to Secretary Baker. You know, he goes, we tried. We wanted them to be more of a democracy and, you know, capitalism and bring them in the family of nations. And, you know, he said it just didn't work. And um, so we gave them a lot. What we didn't give them, they stole. Uh, there's a reason why the Houston Consulate was shut down, because they were stealing all this IP from our universities, our Texas Medical Center, NASA. And then I would say what, we, uh, what they haven't stolen, we sell to them. If you look at the hypersonic, a lot of that's built on the backbone of American technology. And so this gets me into what we call the Export Control Act, which is under foreign affairs jurisdiction. In fact, we're doing some of these sanctions against Russia right now on semiconductors. Um, there are these entities list. Department of Commerce has it one. Department of Defense has one. But they're not the same. DOD's is more security. <clears throat> Commerce is more, you know, industry. So you look at this, uh, this Bureau of Industry and Security within Commerce. We got this information, and I was able to make it public, that just in the last year alone, only 1% of the export licenses were denied and that $60 billion was going into China from the United States to invest in Huawei, $40 billion into China to invest in SMIC, which is their semiconductor company. So why are we doing this? We want to marry the list. So these are entities that would go straight to the POA, straight into their military uh, apparatus. Um, now, some of it's civil military fusion, but this, these are companies that if you invest in there, you're investing in Chinese, China's military program that's going to turn right back at us. So we have to, in my judgment, and, you know, this is not going to be an easy thing to do navigating through all this, but we have to stop exporting this technology to our adversary that uses it to build its war machine that they're turning against us. You don't think President Xi's looking at Taiwan right now with Putin and what he's doing in Ukraine? I'm, I'm worried that the next shoe is going to be Xi because he's always wanted Taiwan. He sees weakness. And if he goes into Taiwan and the, the, at the South China Sea, it's very strategic. <clears throat> but what else? As I mentioned before, 90% of our advanced semiconductor chip cap manufacturing. So um, this is going to be a... a Really interesting. You know, the next Congress, you know, stay tuned because we're going to get, um, I ho hopefully do some big things that are going to, at the end of the day, protect American companies and our technology and our national security. Um, all right. So I'd like to end this session um, on, a, on a little bit of a different note um, by having you talk about one of your colleagues, a, a member that you've worked a lot with over the years, um, Jim Langevin, who's announced he won't be seeking re-election this fall. You and he have worked together on countless cybersecurity issues. 
um, over the years. Um, you and he have formed a great bipartisan duo on a lot of these matters as it relates to DHS and security issues and technology issues. You know, talk a little bit about kind of um, y your work with him over the years and and what you think his departure is going to mean for congressional cybersecurity policy leadership and and kind of who maybe you see um, as kind of the next generation on the on the democratic side, a democratic side where where you can team up with some folks. Yeah, yeah you know, well, first, let me, um, you're making me feel kind of old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd wake up and I'm like, Mike, this is my ninth term. In con I never thought, uh, but, um, you know, it, it kind of symbolizes the, the passing of an era. Uh, you know, we wrote that CSI, CSIS report yeah, 15 years ago before it was cool to be in cyber. And I mean, now everybody talks about cyber. And um, and with some really talented people um, and, and uh, um but there's something missing today uh, that that is wrong that I think um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to fix it for the American people. And it's this, this uh, intense political division that goes beyond a debate on policy, but rather you're an enemy um, and you're a, an evil, bad person, right, if you're on the other side of the aisle. And it's on both sides. You have extremities on both my side of the aisle and on uh, from the left and the right. But it hurts the body politic. The way the founding fathers set this up was compromise was necessary to get anything done. Um, today, it's, it's a dirty word. If I went back home to my district and said, you know what I'm most proud of is I, 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 I got ranked by the Luger Institute as most and Georgetown most effective Republican. You know why? because I'm bipartisan. But you know what, if I went home to my base and told them that, they'd probably, you know, they'd probably throw me out of office. Like, we didn't elect you to, to get along with the, we didn't, you know, you need to fight. Okay, we have, our, we have plenty of fights, but we also have to get things done. And the only way to get things done is, you know, hey, I've got a great idea on breach notification, right? Who am I going to go to? I'm not going to, I can go to one of my, you know, my side of the aisle, but if I really want it to pass, it's got to be bipartisan. And so I go to Jim and he's just a fantastic guy. He's not an ideologue. He, he's very policy driven. He loves cybersecurity. You know, the issue, uh, I'm going to miss him a lot because I think he's irreplaceable to answer your question. But I, I think there, there are a lot of younger members now that they understand this stuff well, a lot better than when I first got elected. But beyond the issue of cyber, I think it's just the damage to, you know, the, the institution. And um, I hope, you know, we can repair some of that damage in the, in the years to come and, and get back to some decency. You know, Chairman Meeks and I don't agree on everything. We're pragmatic, and we, we basically have an understanding. Like, look, you're not going to agree on it with everything I want to do, and vice versa. But it's like when I just came out of Israel, right? They put 10 parties together in the Knesset. I mean, can you imagine that? So, and I said, how'd you do that? They said, well, we realize that we agree actually on 70% of the issues. It's the 30% that we fight over. And so they have this bond between all these different parties. We'll see, we'll see how that goes, but that's probably reflective, you know, the Congress. We probably agree like on cyber, that's almost a 100% issue. But we probably agree on 70%. It's that 30% that you probably see on television or being debated in public. But anyway, the chairman and I, we can agree to disagree, but we can do so with civility. And we don't have to be disrespectful of each other. I disagree with their views, but I respect that. You know, I think they're misguided, but I, I respect that. And I'm not going to throw a temper tantrum and start yelling and screaming, which uh, I think is very immature-ish. And you see a lot of members do that now. and they Or they go on TV, you know, to get attention. and Or, you know, social media has changed politics forever. And, you know, they'll go on YouTube and rant and rave. And you know what? They get a lot of clicks. And they raise a lot of money off it. 
but they don't give a, a darn about getting anything done in the Congress. I don't care. I didn't get elected to go on social media or YouTube and, you know, rant and rave. You know, I got elected to get things done. And I, I hope that starts to, we start to get some of that back, you know. Well, that's a great way to, great way to end this session. Thank you very much for doing it. Um, I'd ask everyone to please join me in, in thanking the congressman for being here today. Thank you, sir, for doing it. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate uh, you. Well done.